to start as a cartoonist in this region. It was 1947 or 46, 47, I got down at this Bombay Central coming from Delhi because I had gone there in search of a job. I couldn't get any. The papers there said you are too young, you have to go and try your luck in provincial papers. Fair enough, I said. I came to Bombay and uh, got down because I wanted to see Bombay because I would never have had an opportunity to do so once I get back to South, Madras, Mysore, Bangalore, who knows. So I got down, found a place and wandered around. I found during that time they were digging the roads vigorously. I asked, uh, what is this you are digging the roads for? A telephone cable, sir, we are uh, putting the telephone cables. The telephones are not working properly, so we are putting the cables. Good. I went further down uh, near Warden Road. They were digging again there. I said, what are you doing? They said, we are putting the drainage pipe. And further on, I went and I found the water pipes are being light. So like that, all over Bombay, I wandered. They were digging, digging, digging. Can you believe 43 letters, a year later, they're still doing it? <laughs> I go and ask them, what are you doing? We are laying telephone cable, sir. Further up, water supply has been very sp scarce, so we are putting new water pipes. And drainage pipe, population has increased, so we are increasing the uh, diameter of the drainage pipe. So that goes on and on and on. Road digging became, after I joined Times of India during that period, 1947, that became a, my pet subject. I did many cartoons on road digging and uh, potholes. When people asked me, what is the secret of your success? My secret road to success is Bombay roads. <laughs> However, I must, that has nothing to do with the common man because I am going to speak about him, Mr. Kulekar, without consulting me, <laughs> quietly slipped in a subject about which I don't know anything, the common man. Once I got into the Times of India, I found this business of bringing out a paper and drawing cartoons for it is one of great strain because the Democles sword of deadlines was the order of the day, day after day. And the days followed with the most disarranged, no sequence, nothing. And I have to pick up a subject they followed in, in a bewildering order of content. I, as a cartoonist, has to choose a subject within a given time, because I didn't have the whole day to do anything, finish the cartoon, give it and go home, only to get up next morning, come back, again face the same problem, which I am doing now, still. The days followed in a weird type of disorder. Today, it will, everybody will be grumbling and there will be headlines in the paper about the price of sugar. Price of sugar has gone up or scarcity of uh, cooking oil. So that I used to target as my subject. Happy with the subject, happy with the drawing I had done, I go home, come back and find the very next day, it is such a different subject from the one I had drawn the previous day. The subject might be, ecological problem, the holes in the ozone layer, how the human beings and animals are going to be barbecued in course of time if we don't control pollution. My God, that has to be my subject for the day, not sugar, not cooking oil, but ozone layer. Another day it will be budget, taxation. 
Monday, it is taxation. Tuesday, rise in fuel oil, petrol. Wednesday, it is Jharkhand Morcha. <laughs> Wednesday, increase in petrol again. Thursday, perhaps another increase in the petrol. <laughs> <laughs> or cabinet reshuffle, walkouts, defections, and so on and on. Each one of them I have of most important, vital importance to me as a cartoonist. And most certainly to the common man. It is of greater importance to the common man because I extract my livelihood through these subjects, but poor common man suffers these events. The common man, the whole world revolves around the common man. Nations big and tiny exist for the sake of this man. An entire geopolitical unit called a state at all levels from villages to urban cities is preoccupied with the ways of improving the quality of life for this man. Battles of elections are fought and won for him. Plans are conceived and provided. Blueprints are prepared. Charts are drafted for bridging a valley for his sake or putting a highway through jungles for him to go or building a mammoth reservoir for water so that he may drink drinking water water bureaucrats politicians vie with each other to make this dream come true for the common man they are very happy they want to give it to him Plan after plan, they want to give it to him. They look around and calculate the financial implications of this and find there is no money for this kind of thing. So what do you do? They can't help but dip their hand into the pocket of the very common man they want to save. <laughs> then they find that poor fellow doesn't have a few, few rupees only for him. They don't have enough in his pocket. So they catch the plane and dash around the world to every institution and benevolent institutions and the patrons of the third world, as it used to be called, as with hat in hand, asking for loan, aid, and so on. Of course, these politicians do get aid and loan. Most very often, at humiliating terms, at punitive interest rates. But the politicians say, never mind, never mind. Humiliation and suffering is, any sacrifice is not enough for the sake of the common man. <laughs> but who is this common man? Where do you find him? He's in a bus queue, or he's in a marketplace, or in the secretariat. Or is in the railway station. Where is he? Go. Try to find him. You won't find him. You will be only jostled by more tangible evidences of people like uh, politicians, like uh, share brokers, like uh, judges, engineers, businessmen bureaucrats and so on. But the common man won't be there at all. You can't find him, simply can't find him. In our day-to-day -day life, we bump into these characters, but never bump into the common man. But such an important person, the VIP, VVIP, VVVIP of the entire world, the common man, is not to be found. He's only nebulous. I was intrigued by this when I became the cartoonist. I was mystified, mystified by this enigma. 
So I went in search of this man. I must find him. Where? Well, uh, I, in my wanderings, I found in front of a serpentine queue of a government ration shop, a chap who fitted the role. He had the necessary lines of experience on his face, and parallel lines of wonder were stamped on his receding forehead over his bushy eyebrows. And he had the expression of acceptance of his position in the eternal queue for a better life. I went and timidly I approached him. I asked with the most respectfully, Sir, excuse me, sir, are you the famous common man? <laughs> he turned to me rather in surprise and said, no, 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 I am only a clerk in the municipal office. Uh, the person you are searching for is, I think, right behind somewhere down the line, not me. Please go and inquire there. So I went in search of that working backward on the queue. There I found a man who fitted the role. I went and asked, sir, are you the common man? That fellow seemed annoyed. I said, certainly not. I'm a sub-inspector standing here, and I'm not the common man. <laughs> what makes you think I'm the common man? Such contempt he had in his voice. Then I looked here and there. I confronted people. Either they were industrialists, judges, hawkers, postmen, clerks, varied type of people who we come across, but not the common man. These people didn't want to own the common manship because they didn't want their individuality to be diluted in the larger concept of the masses.